let me open up a little prayer and then we'll, we'll start moving through. So, Father God, I just want to thank you again for this opportunity uh, to spend time with these awesome people. Um, I just ask that you open our minds and open our hearts um, and speak to us directly, Father God. We invite you in. We invite the Holy Spirit into this place right now at this time that you can work in us as we read your word and try to absorb it into our lives, Father God. We just thank you so much for being your son, Jesus. We pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so this summer, since Pastor Tom has been gone, um, Derek kicked us off the first couple of weeks. Um, he taught us a little bit from Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3, which is on, on the front of our bulletin. But he talked about um, basically three different ways to, to view that. We've got uh, an upward focus, an inward focus, and a communal focus. Um, Greg Dodge then also used the story of the prodigal son in the Bible, and he referenced the father in that situation, and now he kind of did the same thing. He would look up to God to try to honor him, uh, obviously <coughs> let God into his heart to change his heart and so that he could act more like God wanted him to act through this very difficult time, and then looking out where he was actually searching for his son that had been gone and came back, and it was very, uh, very well done, Greg, by the way. Um, I love uh, modern technology. I get a chance to, to kind of watch the teaching as I was gone, so, so very, very good. And then Derek talked also about um, what it means to make disciples um, and the Great Commission and um, what Jesus really charged the, the disciples with. Uh, when he left them, he said, listen, go out and make disciples. That's your number one job. And um, Derek talked about pouring everything that God has poured into us and other people. Use the example of a cup. So, um, so today we're going to kind of recap. Uh, last time I had a chance to spend time with you, um, we talked about this guy named Saul. Remember him? Um, he, uh, he was pretty charged up about life in general, uh, but especially about um, basically hunting down Christians and, and uh, trying to, uh, to arrest them and take them back to Jerusalem where they would face trial and then often situations they would, they would be killed in the process. But, but he had an encounter with Jesus. Um, and uh, we talked about his conversion and how there were kind of two parts to that. The first part was his decision. He said, yeah, I get it. Okay, I changed my mind. Uh, I've denied the fact that you are the Son of God and that you are our Savior. And now I, I, I see that and I get it. Uh, but there was a second piece that had to do with baptism and um, the invitation of the Holy Spirit into his life. And um, we talked about Pentecost and basically when Jesus was, uh, was crucified, uh, he, he came back, he was resurrected, and he spent time with the disciples in his resurrected body. And as he ascended into heaven, he said, listen, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Uh, to live with you and to live inside of you and to help you. And they waited and waited and waited and finally the Holy Spirit showed up in a big way. And we talked about the power of the Holy Spirit and watched a little message from Billy Graham that uh, he basically said, listen, you're not born again until you're inhabited by the Holy Spirit. And uh, we can say that we love God and we can profess our commitment to Jesus Christ, but until we yield to the Holy Spirit in our lives, then we are not truly born again. So, um, we're going to break it down just a little deeper today. Uh, we're going to go to Ephesians um, chapter 4, starting with verse 17. For anybody wants to turn to that. So we talked about Saul, and Saul, as his life was changed dramatically, he took a 180, even got a new name, and he's uh, Paul. And he was involved and really planting many, many churches. And uh, this, this letter that he wrote to the Ephesians, um, he had planted a church in Ephesus. And this is about 20 years or so after his conversion. So he had the conversion experience. He immediately started preaching. We talked about that. But he spent years with God preparing for his ministry on the earth. And as a result of that, he went out and planted churches. 
and he was making disciples. And, uh, and in the church of Ephesus, he basically wrote this letter to encourage them. Um, in other letters, you'll see in the New Testament, he, he had a different motivation. He was working on correction, but really, here I don't know that there was great evidence that there was a lot of sin in the church, but I think he recognized the fact that these are fairly new believers and were vulnerable to the ways of the world, and sometimes we can allow the world to influence us instead of us going out and influencing the world. So he wrote this letter to the Ephesians. We're going to read a few verses. We'll talk about it, and then we'll read some more. Um, so starting in verse 17, it says, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So we'll break there for a minute. Um, let me just ask God to bless the hearing and the reading of the Holy Word. Um, I'd like to ask questions of you. I don't know if it's a character flaw or not, but that's just kind of what I do. So, um, so what did you hear in there? What, what is Paul suggesting to the church in Ephesus? Yes? He's encouraging the church to hear from the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yeah, he's basically saying, okay, the world is out there. I get it. You're living in the world. Um... You can live in the world and not yield to it. So listen to what God wants from us. What else? Anybody else? Yes. Put him first. Put him first. Very good. Mr. Dodge? Put off the old self and the old desires. <clears throat> Put on holiness. Put on Christ. So he's suggesting to them that it's a conscious decision to take off our old ways and to set them aside and to pick up our new ways and put them on. I don't think I just put this jacket on earlier. Not something I wear every day. Probably sweating a little bit under here. Woo! But, uh, yes. I'm going to ask you to repeat what you said about believing in God because you have to have the Holy Spirit. Okay. So, who's your So, this is evident here, right? That we can make the choice to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And we can say that we're Christians, but until we pick up our new selves and accept the Holy Spirit into our hearts, here's the hard part, we're going to read more about this later, is yielding to that idea and allowing Him to make decisions about what we do and say in the world. Um, not something that happens overnight, and for me, I, I'm assuming, you know, we look at Paul, and although he changed his mind right away, and when I start teaching, God took several years to prepare for his ministry. And I think he works that way in us as well. But we have to, at some point in time, say, okay, what I think is right really doesn't matter. And what the Word says and what the Holy Spirit nudges me to do is what really matters. So very good. Uh, yes? What I like to do is like, when I really need God and I put on a dry right. suit, but then all the other stuff I think they're all yeah. <laughs> and I think, you know, we, we, we are human. And, and that's the one thing that Jesus, one reason we know that Jesus was the Messiah, one of the many reasons, is because he lived in the world without sin. And he knew that we weren't really built to be able to do that, that we're going to make mistakes. We're going to yield to our own desires. Um, you know, I, 
we're going to read some more in this letter. Paul has a lot to say about this. I'm not going to read all of it, don't worry. <laughs> but we are going to read a little bit more, because I'd rather you hear it from Paul than from me. Um, but we're going to read some more. But I, I'm, like, really convicted by this. Um, you know, I still allow anger. I still allow a judgmental attitude. My impatience. I allow that to enter into my life. And usually it hurts the people I love the most. Um, but I'm human, right? I'm going to make mistakes. Um, and I just pray to God that he'll, he'll forgive me and that my family forgives me as well. But, um, but let's go to verse 25 and we'll read some more. Bear with me and I'm going to ask you again. The Holy Spirit nudges you. Let me back up as well. Um, can I get an amen? Amen. You know it's okay to say that out loud every once in a while. Amen. That really, amen, is just you saying, yes, I agree. That is awesome. I love you, God, and your word is awesome. So if you feel like you can say amen once in a while, I might even ask for one or two. Yeah. <laughs> you guys just go for it, yeah? All right. We're supposed to be praising God in this place, and let's do it. All right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Bring it, sister, bring it. All right. um, verse 25, it says, again, he goes on, and it says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not the sun go down while you are still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may be benefit, that it may benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God, forgave you. Be imitators of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, or rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure no immoral, impure, or greedy person such as a man is an, is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruit, fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is says, it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Once again, may God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. So there's a lot of stuff in there, isn't there? Oh my gosh. Wow. So, um, anybody, what has God led you to share? Derek. There are times.
times when situations, circumstances will make me angry, but there's an appropriate response that I have to do, a Christian response, even when I'm angry. It didn't say never be angry. It said be angry and sin not. So the sin not part, I need to respond like Jesus. So there are examples of Jesus getting angry. And we know Jesus didn't sin. It's called righteous anger. Um, I struggle with that as well. I can sometimes get angry just because I'm angry. And, um, and I don't respond appropriately. So very good. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Dodge? You've got to put off the old man. You've got to mortify him. You've got to kill it. You've got to separate yourself from him. You got to, and then you've got to turn around and put on a new man. You've got to edify him. Be thankful. Don't agree with those that are doing wrong. You've got to expose that evil. You've got to believe and be prudent. You've got to walk in the Spirit and be holy as He is holy. Amen. Amen. Uh, that's a tough one, isn't it? You know, uh, and that's, as a Christian, we are to be Christ-like. So we don't do those things the way we think we should do them. We, we do them the way that Jesus showed us how to do them. Yes, Brad. Sometimes we can get stuck in shame and we can beat ourselves up. And when we beat ourselves up, that puts a wall between us and Christ and being able to walk with Christ. And he does not want us to do that. So we are to take off the old man, but we have to be careful not to be so hard on ourselves. And I know I can be very hard on myself because I'm very driven. And God made me that person to, to, to be that person of joy and get out there and do it. But at the same time, I have to have a balance. And I have to know that God loves me. And he doesn't expect me to work 20 hours a day or be perfect, but I don't have to walk in shame because he's going to get me there one way or another as long as I keep walking. Amen. Yes, amen. That's right. Give us an amen. That's right. Good. So we talked about this last summer, the, the Lord's Prayer that we read often. It talks about forgiveness, right? And... Um, not only does God forgive us when we repent, repentance is suggesting that we want to change our ways. Amen. Not that every time we show up and ask for forgiveness, we can just, it gives us license to continue to sin. And sometimes some people see it that way. But we're supposed to make an effort to change. As long as we do that, God forgives us, right? And it's like, it never happened. In his eyes. He's moving along, right? We're supposed to handle our relationships the same way. Kind of a struggle sometimes. We like to keep score, right? And uh, but the biggest thing, Pastor Tom's helped me with that a lot over the years. Greg, that condemnation is not coming from from God. You realize that, right? You know, don't give the devil a foothold. That's basically what that means. Uh, anybody else? And anything you heard here? Yes. Well, when you hear people complaining, I, I like to tell them that uh, the complaint is a compliment that hasn't matured yet. A compliment that hasn't matured yet. Wow. All we're doing is talk. Okay, I hear you. just haven't realized how to talk. So you hear over and over and over and over again in the word that we should be praising God, right? Regardless of the situation, doesn't mean we can't complain to him every once in a while. You see David in the Psalms. It happens a lot, right? <laughs> Real and I just had a talk this morning about uh, there was an opportunity over the when we were gone. Um, you know, sometimes we like to call people out. And not necessarily in positive ways. And how there's a difference between how Jesus did it and how we want to do it. And um you know, sometimes it means complaining about other people, um, but uh, it's kind of a fine line there. And we also talked about about feeling um, convicted. That sometimes we feel bad about stuff. That doesn't mean that's a bad thing. That's how God changes our heart sometimes by giving us remorse. But as long as we repent and move on, then we shouldn't have to carry it around. Derek mentioned that earlier. We shouldn't be leaving here. I don't know, I don't remember how I put it, but come in with 40 pounds and leave with 65 on something like that. But we shouldn't leave here feeling heavier, but if, you're, if you are feeling conviction in your heart, make a change. Don't go out there and just continue to do whatever it is God is convicting you. Just 
make a change. And then you'll be lucky. If we continue to fill that backpack up with our junk, without making changes in our lives, then it can get heavier, like it can get a lot heavier. Um, anybody else for a new one? Yes. I have a question. It says, take a look at the unfruitful works of darkness and is done to expose them. And the next thing it says, where it's shameful even to speak to the things that they do in secret. So how can you expose something and then it's saying it's shameful to even talk about it? I think we have to look at how Jesus handled himself in the Bible when we when he talk like the woman at the well. He didn't walk up to her and say, Listen, you had five wives, you're basically a prostitute, stop it. He didn't do that. He came alongside her and he loved her and he gave her an opportunity to believe. So I wish I had a black and white answer for that question because I struggle with that myself. But there are times when I'm sorry. There are times when um, when you might look to the, your pastor for guidance on that. Um, there are times when you might say, Greg, I love you, man. Um, there's this thing that you're doing that I'd like to talk to you about. Um, can we talk about it? Um, like I say, that's probably one area that I fall short the most. Uh, go ahead. I think we like to um, take things that we know we should probably change, and I don't. And this is saying, we need to get it out to you. Yes. And, and admit that we're doing these things that so we can ask God to forgive us again, then we're not doing it. But I think <coughs> when I'm helping with something wrong, says something wrong, I like to forget about it, put it over here, so I don't feel like I'm trying to take it back to God. It's got to be like, I just want to do it. So if you look at Jesus, see, one of the reasons the Pharisees hated him. Because he hung out with sinners. So he went to them. He had dinner with them, right? He hung out with them. And through that process, he was able to model what he was talking about. But he also, I wasn't there, but I envisioned that he would say, Listen, brother, that's the wrong way. This is the right way. Come with me. Come with me. This is the right way. So there's some subtle, gentle ways to do that that I think Jesus modeled. Yeah. Uh, just a question about no. the words of the secret on that. Is it, is it for us to not speak about it in secret? Because they're not really doing it in secret, are they? They're exposing themselves if they do it. So we're pretty exposed <coughs> as opposed to talking amongst ourselves in secret about what they're doing and not for us to do You know, so the way I see that is sometimes people come to church, like they got it all together, and they go home and they're browsing and doing things that they should know they shouldn't be doing, and they don't want anybody to know about it. So there are times where we might have to wrap our arms around our brother and say, listen, man, I know what's going on that I'm talking about. Um, so once again, there's a lot here. Not going to tackle it all today, but, um, you know, and that, that's one of the things that we're going to watch a quick video from Francis Chan here in a few minutes, and he talks about that. He says, you know, I'm not really sure, you know, but I'm trying to figure out. I'm in the Word every day. I'm trying to figure out what it really means. So sometimes it is a mystery to us until we can look through it. One more back here and then we'll move on. Yeah. Yes? Okay. Um, I used to complain a lot. Okay. I, say I used to be able to complain a lot. And the Lord dealt with me because He said, you know, I just don't like rumors. But He also spoke to my heart and said, now, you know, if you have a complaint, bring it to me. Bring it to the altar. Bring it to me. And when I hear other people who are speaking and they're upset, God, I look at it as God giving me discernment so that I know how to pray for them and redirect it to positive. But then in my secret place with Him, I need to give that to Him. And it's okay. I'm not being angry. Sometimes I am saying, Father, I'm upset about something, but I'm in a conversation with Him and I honor and respect Him and I fear Him. But I know that my conversation with him, he hears, even if I have to take a meeting in my closet for three hours because something bothers me, he'll get it out if I yeah. humble myself before him and let it. Awesome. Like I said, you look through everything King David wrote, a lot of times he was really frustrated, and a lot of times he complained, but he took it to God. He didn't take it to his brothers and sisters in the church. That's called gossip, by the way. And you know what? Uh, my friends in the church can't help me. 
God can. I like perpetuate negative things and create a negative atmosphere by only gossip about it. So thank you for that. Very, very good. Let's, um, so Greg, I'm sorry to keep throwing your hand up there. Uh, just, just two things. When, when he's talking to him, he's talking to the Ephesians, which are supposed to be following Christ. Right. Okay. So in Galatians 6.1 it says, you who are spiritual come alongside, right? And 6 1, and then go, and Matthew 15, it talks about if you see your brother sin against you, go to him first. If he doesn't listen, then a brother, then go to the church. So there's ways to expose that way. Gotcha. So, yes, I mean, that's one of the things that we know through Jesus' life is we're responsible to go out into the world and influence it, and that's not vice versa. Like we talked about earlier. So, Francis Chan, I, I just, he's got a lot of energy. Um, He's a really good speaker. He's got a quick message here that kind of piggybacks on this idea. So let's watch this briefly and then we'll pray. Thank you, Lord.
do with my effort, my passions, my resources. Because this is just little seed time. Like when you drop the seed, that, that's just how quick it is. That's it. And the question is, what do you do with your life? And some of you are absolutely wasting it. And I'm telling you now, so I, I can go with a clean conscience and go, you know what, I told them. Everything else is a waste. And I am constantly reevaluating my life. From God, okay, now, am I doing what I need to be doing? Am I investing like I ought to be investing? I'm constantly looking at my life because I realize this is all that matters. And we'll all see it one day. I just don't want it to catch you by surprise. See, when I look at this verse and it says, it says do good to all believers, you know, to all people, while well, we have the opportunity, I, I look at what I'm doing right now and I go, okay, this is my opportunity to do good. Uh, th this is what I do. This is what I do well, is just, just to speak and to speak God's word. And it's so, like, you know, the most loving thing I can do is, is not come here and entertain you and make you feel good about yourself, but to get up here and speak truth this morning and say, look, this is it. You need to take a long, hard look at how you invest in your life and how you invest the rest of it. Because so much of what you did this week really is not going to matter. You've sown into the flesh and all that stuff's going to decay and be destroyed. And yet for those of you who who have been trying to live the way God wants you to, you're sacrificing, you're holding on, I'm begging you, don't give up. Okay? I know it's tired. Believe me, I know it's exhausting sometimes, but the Bible says you'll reap a harvest if you do not give up. And I want to look at you years and years and years from now and say, I told you it was worth it, right? You know? I mean, you think anyone in heaven looes back and anything they sacrifice and goes, oh, why did I give that up? No, there's no regrets. And I, I, want to, I, I pray that I, I pray for this weekend, saying, God, I pray the turning point in someone's life, so that they can look at me in heaven and, and I can say, See, told you, it was worth it, not. But I, I mean, told you. You remember, remember two thousand years ago when I told you, I do that and did it. It was worth it, not. And this is this is reality. This is the real stuff, and this is all that matters. Yeah. All right, let's pray. Father oh God, I just want to thank you again just for all that you do, all that you give us, especially for your holy word for this Bible that we read from. Just uh, there's so much inspirational wisdom in it and all the people that live through it. And we just ask you to give us the courage and the strength as we leave here to go out into the world and do those things that really matter. As Francis Chan talked about. That's all that matters is what we do for God. And just help us to live our lives that way. We thank you and praise your name for you. Amen.